the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you to episode number 48, where today, once again, we have a very special guest on. We have Mr. Paul Delaney. So Mr. Delaney has, uh, has been so quite a history that we have. Uh, I met him originally three years ago doing a co-op program at, uh, at my high school. And uh, he, he was basically supervising me. I was, you know, playing around with the telescopes at York University and stuff like that. So anyways, Mr. Delaney is a lecturer, senior lecturer, professor at York University, where he is in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. So before I start talking too much, Mr. Delaney, maybe you want to give a small introduction on, you know, what you do at York and yeah. Thank you very much, Rayhan, and thank you to Parker for inviting me on to the uh, podcast. This is really great. Uh, absolutely. I met uh, Rayhan three years ago, as he indicated, uh, from a co-op experience, and uh, we had a great six months uh, at York uh, during that time. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you know, we've sort of hung out together, so as to speak, from afar uh, ever since. What I do at York, as you indicated, I'm in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I look after the Alan I. Carswell Observatory on campus, have been in that role for about 35 years now. I'm going to retire this year. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, yeah, when I look back on that, I go, wow, gee, 35 years. Whoa. Anyway, uh, apart from the obvious, you see the telescope in the background. That's our one meter telescope there. We've got a variety of both permanently mounted and portable telescopes, which we utilize for our undergraduate astronomy courses. So if you're doing sort of the astronomy stream at York every year of that uh, degree, you will have a laboratory experiment that uh, is requiring the use of the telescope. So wow. we integrate that into the uh, astrophysics program there. But outside of that, of course, there's research. We do a lot of variable star research with these telescopes. We've got a variable star research program that has been running now for 25 years. It's one of the longest running for this particular type of star uh, anywhere on the planet, in fact. Uh, and then, of course, we've got our outreach programs, our Monday and Wednesday night online public viewing, our, our, our um, YouTube teletube. Oh, I stumbled mm -hmm. all over that. Uh, mm -hmm. And, of course, normally when you have the opportunity to come onto campus, there's lots of tour activity. So mm -hmm. high schools, cub packs, uh, uh, various community groups all have the opportunity to come up and look through our telescopes, engage with you know, students like Rayhan. I mean, remember you gave that presentation to the Astronomy was, Club. Right? Yeah, yeah. I was actually, I was actually just going to say, so uh, in, in my co-op experience, right at the end, I gave, a, I gave a presentation to the Astronomy and Physics Club of, of York on like Einstein, Einstein's field equations and gravitational waves and stuff like that. And oh my, that was that was that was an amazing opportunity for me. So obviously, thank you for that. And that was, I think, the best thing that I've I've ever done in physics. So like that was definitely a really cool, really cool. Yeah. So before you blew them away, mate. I mean, yeah, no question. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was really really impressive. I mean, it was such a big opportunity for me because I was 16 years old at that time. And imagine telling my friends, "Hey, I just presented to a bunch of university students," and I'm like in grade 10, 11. These guys are, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So once again, obviously, thank you for that. And before we do get into like fully fledged into the podcast, I uh, do want to mention some quick news and some information. So last week's episode, we forgot to mention uh, the, the comment of the week, which is kind of sad. And because we just started it the week before that. And the first week we, we forgot. So anyways, we're going to continue it. And this week, we have a very, very nice comment. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long. It's by Emma. I'm not going to pronounce the last name because I'm not sure how to. But it's by Emma. She sent us a message on Instagram. And the idea, I'm just going to kind of sum up the idea, is basically that she started listening to the podcast. Uh, she is inspired to go to University of Toronto. But she lives in America. So, you know, all sorts of complications. The interesting thing about this comment is I'm planning on taking AP Physics next year, something I would have never considered a few months ago. Listening to you guys is something I look forward to every day. You guys break down concepts in a way that is not only easy to comprehend, but intriguing at the same time. And 
I think I think this comment was amazing. And this is the point of our podcast, you know, to, to share our love of phys- math and physics and to inspire others to get into this field. You know, that's that's the whole point. So thank you, Emma. Yeah, and thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, other than that, we do have just a little update for you guys. We have officially gone over 4,600 followers Ooh. on Spotify and also 250 subscribers on YouTube. So if you are listening to this on Spotify or Apple or anywhere else where you're just listening to the audio, make sure to check out the video version of this podcast on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, in terms of downloads, we are over 60,000 total downloads. Uh, so our, we are on our way to 100,000 very soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um I think that's I think that's about yeah. it. So to, to if those you have any to those viewers questions, that, uh, make sure to yeah yeah. So I I was just saying to to those viewers that are probably well viewing the YouTube video or from Spotify came onto the YouTube video once again might be able to notice I am not at my house. I am in fact in Niagara, and the falls is right next to me. Unfortunately, I so the the plan the plan of this podcast was so that the 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 falls would be in the background and that would just be a beautiful sight. But very unfortunately, and I kind of thought this would happen. There's too much light coming from there, right? So if the light's from the back, I just I'll just be completely you know exposed or like dark. So I guess that didn't work. But I just wanted to mention it to those people watching it because they must be like, this guy always is in a new place. Where is he? So yeah, here I am. <laughs> Hey, at the Sorry, end of today's yeah. podcast, turn the computer around. That can be your fade out. I can do that. I can do that. That's actually a smart idea. That might be that might be nice. That might be nice. So yeah, so Parker, you were just uh summing up all the places that they can go and follow us. So sorry, that's I right. So there. if you have any questions or comment you comments, you can email us at math.physics.podcast at gmail.com. Or you can check out our Instagram where we post our updates and when our, when we post our episodes or any kind of news at math.physics.podcast. Mm-hmm. Also on TikTok, same same handle and um, on Twitter. At We're starting Math to post TikToks Physics. now. We, we, we said that two weeks ago yeah. and we did not do yeah. anything. But I think now we're going to no, start. No, we will, we will start. We will yeah. start. Um, well, I guess continue. Um, yeah, we will continue. continue. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. So yeah, that's about it. Yeah, so we can start off with uh, with the classic question that we have for every one of our guests that come on the podcast. What first got you or inspired you into the field of astronomy, math and math and astronomy? Like, what, what, was there one moment? Was there a collection of yeah. events? What? Yeah, that's the question. If you go all the way back to when I was about nine years old, grade three, my grade three teacher wrote in the report, went home to my parents, that Paul had a great knowledge of the planets in our solar system. That's the earliest moment that I can recall a passion for astronomy. Why it manifested itself in grade three, don't remember. (laughs) But from that point forward, there was never any doubt in my mind that I wanted to be an astronomer. Now, th- this worried my parents a lot because they didn't know anybody who was an astronomer. Uh, they were terribly worried that you know he wasn't going to get a job. I mean, who, who employs an astronomer <laughs> and so on, of course. And you know, my parents were not scientists in any way, shape or form. So they had no idea about the progress from elementary school to high school and beyond if this guy their son wanted to be an astronomer. So I think it was both an exciting revelation from their point of view, as well as great trepidation. But from my point of view, there was never any doubt. From that day forward, I consumed everything I could about astronomy. I started reading science fiction because, of course, I was learning to read at that point in time. And science fiction seemed a really natural outlet. There were lots of people who were running around space. That's what I like looking at. So Mm -hmm. there was no aha moment, but from as I say, age nine, there has never been any doubt about what I wanted to do as a profession, both as an amateur and as a professional. Mm-hmm. Wow. And in high school, did the the math and the physics, like all of the concepts, they came easily to you? 
I wouldn't say it came easily to me, but I enjoyed it. And if you enjoy it, you know, and you put in the time, invariably success follows. So yes, you know, the math and the chemistry and the physics, I took them all the way through high school from, you know, the moment I arrived at high school right through to the end. And that's what I graduated with from high school. Uh, Yeah, I, yeah, as I say, I, I don't think coming easily to me, uh, I'm just not naturally gifted in that regard, but because I enjoyed doing it, I never had an issue putting in the time uh, to hone the skill. And mm-hmm. as a consequence, you know, my math, my physics, my chemistry worked out pretty well. And I carried that into the university environment. But no, I, I wouldn't say it came easily, but I really did enjoy it. And, and that's perhaps one of the takeaway messages for whatever discipline people are going to engage in. If you like doing something, it's not work. And it then, generally speaking, results in, well, we're talking about Mm -hmm. grades here, successful grades, good grades, and that opens up opportunities, choice for you with respect to your future endeavors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so I was just saying, so when you came into university, did you, so I guess because you already knew since age nine, but when you came into university, did you ever, I don't know, like explore different subjects and were like, hey, that's kind of interesting, that's kind of interesting. Or did you always simply stick to the astronomy mindset that you were you were comfortable with? Very good question. Um, I mean, back then when I entered uh, university, because <clears throat> we're talking 1974 here, gentlemen, uh, mm-hmm. you know, even then there are breadth requirements for a university degree to give students the opportunity to explore areas outside of the uh, outside of their comfort zone, if you will, to make mm-hmm. sure that you know the decision they're making about their future academic pathway is in fact the correct one. So yeah, I took geology uh, when I came into university, wow. along with the math and the physics and the chemistry. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. There was, you know, I wasn't about to become a poet. Uh, I wasn't about to become <laughs> a stage dancer or anything like that. So it was going to be science. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, math, physics, chemistry, but I took geology. And I always thought during that year with geology that, you know, I could really get into geology and archaeology instead of astronomy. I didn't go that pathway because I just wasn't as good at it, (laughs) to be perfectly (laughs) blunt. But it was something that really did excite me. Uh, So, yeah, I did look around a little bit. I, 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 I wanted to be in science. Biology never turned me on. So biology, zoology, those sorts of things. I just wasn't that type of a scientist. So it had to be in the physical sciences. I thought astronomy was where I wanted to be. I was pretty sure, but I did take geology and I really did enjoy my chemistry. I took chemistry through second year, in fact, because I enjoyed my chemistry. But the love of astronomy certainly won out, which is what I was expecting. But breadth requirements at a university, really, really important. Don't just slough them off because Mm -hmm. you never know what door they may open. And in my case, mm-hmm. as I say, geology and archaeology was a door that I nearly reached out to, but I didn't. <laughs> in a sense, geology is kind of a subset of astronomy because you're studying a planet. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Quite correct. Uh, oh, and, and let's face it, when we go to the moon, when we go to Mars, when we go to any of the other bodies in our solar system, geology is an essential yeah. ingredient. Yeah, so you're definitely. right. It, 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 it wasn't a big stretch to think about geology and archaeology compared to straight out astronomy. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And I just had a comment uh, from what you said earlier about, you know, when you like what you're doing, it's not work. And a lot of people ask, uh, they ask me about my courses and I tell them, oh, I'm doing astrophysics. They're like, oh, aren't your courses like super difficult, like quantum physics, uh, calculus? I'm like, yeah, it's it's difficult, but it's not it's not hard for me to do the work. The work is hard, but it's easy for me to just, you know, and then get lost in, in all of the interesting concepts that are coming mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, I Quite. think like that's where passion comes in, right? Like your passion kind of substitutes for any difficulty because a lot of times like when there's a really difficult problem, you're like, oh no, like I can't wrap my head around it. But if you're really passionate about the subject, like if you really enjoy it, then you will simply keep working on that question because you like to work on that question. Not because you have to or not because you need to, but because you like to. And I think that's, that's, what, that, that's what's more important. Um, a, 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 yeah. That's absolutely correct. And so you know, when, when you're a student, doing studies at you know senior high school in university or indeed graduate school there's a lot of time effort and energy that is required to become good at whatever it is that you're you're studying mm-hmm. don't be afraid to spend the time you know 
sometimes you look at your friends and you go, gosh, they got the answer far quicker than I did. You know, they only had to spend an hour or two studying for, you know, fill in the gap with midterm test or an assignment. I had to spend three or four hours. It doesn't matter. If, if you're spending the time to be successful and you're enjoying it, the time commitment is just, you know, there. It's not a big issue. Don't worry about the mm -hmm. fact that it takes you more time than your friend to get to a certain point. Tortoise in the hair type stuff, right? You'll always get to the finish line. It doesn't matter how rapidly. What matters is getting there and the quality result once you get there. Wow, that's the most inspirational sure. words to any, any aspiring university student right there. <laughs> wow. Um, question I had was, were you interested in observational astronomy? Like before that you were interested, like, let me formulate this better. Did you like astronomy because you're like, hey, the stars are cool, the planets are cool, or did you like it because you're like, I can see these things and I can make comments on their observations? Basically, like, were you more of a visual astronomer or like a practical, like a theoretical astronomer? Like, which stream did you enjoy? I think it'd have to be the visual, the observational astronomer. Okay. I remember so clearly when I got my first telescope, I was 16. And again, my parents were very worried because they'd never bought a telescope before. And this was a major investment. <laughs> and what, you know, what did they look for in a quality telescope? Anyway, I remember I, I even named it Robbie was my first <laughs> telescope. It was a four and a half inch Newtonian reflector and taking it out into the backyard and looking up at Alpha Centauri and looking over at the large Magellanic cloud. Oh, I was it was magic. It was gorgeous. Wow. Uh, I always like looking at the night sky, the moon. Let's face it. Everybody looks at the moon and you get excited over the moon. Grab a pair of binoculars. Don't have to have a telescope. Look at the moon with binoculars. Experience lunar eclipses and so on. Yeah, I, I, I got bitten by the observational bug very early on. And the southern hemisphere with the Milky Way high overhead. Remember, I lived at a time <laughs> when um, light pollution wasn't as big a problem as it is today. So my skies in my backyard, even though I lived in downtown Adelaide, a uh, city of about a million people, the skies were still quite dark. You could see the Magellanic clouds with the naked wow. eye. And so you can't anymore uh, because I go back to Australia still on a regular basis. So, yeah, I was an observational astronomer from the outset and I loved and I still love being at the telescope. I get a great joy out of looking at a star field, even though other people will go, it's just stars. Yeah, I know, but look at them. They're beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do enjoy the stars and, of course, the nebulae, the galaxies. I also enjoy, of course, teasing apart the stories that they have to tell. They're giving us information about their histories, their lives, and I really do enjoy that now as well. But back when I was starting out, Certainly, it was the observational side of astronomy that drew me ever closer to it. You know, theory goes along hand in hand with the analysis of starlight, but I always prefer collecting the data and looking at the objects more than actually analyzing them. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And this, this next question might be a little packed, but... Um, I heard a while back that neutron stars were very, very spherical and they were almost perfect spheres and they rotate very, very quickly. So can you comment on that and say, maybe explain like why are neutron stars so uh, like perfectly spherical, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, sure. I mean, a neutron star is a stellar remnant. It's the end stage of stellar evolution. So when you're looking at stars that are, you know, generally speaking, three, four times the mass of our sun or larger, they end up their lives as either a neutron star or indeed potentially a black hole. It, it's mass dependent. Stars like our own sun, a couple of times the mass of our sun, they're going to end up creating what we call white dwarfs. But once you go further up the mass scale for stars, the more massive the star, the more, shall I say, titanic is their death throes. So when we're talking about stars with sufficient mass, as I said, at least four times the mass of our sun, we're talking about stars that end their lives in a supernova explosion. That leaves behind a stellar remnant. And again, depending upon mass, <clears throat> we're talking about leaving behind either a neutron star or a black hole. Now you can create neutron stars and black holes in other ways with white dwarfs that end up 
uh, creating too much mass, tripping over the Chandra Seker limit, and, and so on. But generally speaking, we're talking about these objects, which are only a few tens of kilometers in diameter, very, very compact with enormous densities. What has happened there is that the mass that is left over in the cores of these dying stars, or in the case of a white dwarf that accretes too much mass, there is now so much matter that the gravitational force literally overwhelms regular matter, which of course is atoms, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the compaction is so fierce, pulling in uh, so tightly that literally the atom becomes a ball of neutrons. When you're talking about such phenomenal gravitational pull, the only type of object that is going to be able to resist further that compaction process is a sphere, where all points are equally distant from the surface so that there is no uh, atypical or asymmetric gravitational pull so you've got this ball of, of material that starts out being a few tens of thousands of kilometers in size, but the mass has generated such a gravitational pull that it overwhelms matter in the regular atomic format, crushes them to become basically neutrons, and it keeps compacting, compacting, compacting down until it can compact no more, what we call neutron degeneracy rules. And that generally ends up being an object that is a few tens of kilometers in diameter. And as I said, the only object that can uh, result from that level of gravitational compaction is a sphere. And it's rotating, courtesy of the conservation of angular momentum. All stars are rotating. Even our own sun is rotating. It does it about once every 25 to 30 days. It's a pretty slow kind of guy. But nonetheless, it's one and a half million, 1.4 million kilometers in diameter. If you now sort of shed most of that matter and compact the core, angular momentum must be retained. And so smaller radius for a higher mass ends up with a faster rotation rate. Mm -hmm. So take 1.4 million kilometer sphere spinning, bring it down to say 30, 40, 50 kilometers, do the math, uh, you're talking about a phenomenal increase in spin rate associated with the neutron star. Because of I'm course, also, it's not a star. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm also assuming like any asymmetries in the actual star would simply be pulled in by gravity, right? So like it would kind of like balance out that way. Like that's actually pretty interesting. That's right. And, well, you you might have heard of of again, it's a bit of a misnomer. A star quake. Some neutron mm -hmm. stars do change their rotation rate ever so subtly. And we think it's associated with their sort of surfaces cracking a little bit and the rearrangement, if you will, to get rid of that that crack, so yeah. as to speak. So the change in rotation rate is associated with some type of deformation that may have taken place on the surface. I I read somewhere okay. that also in your in your past you were a nuclear physicist. Now, <laughs> what what is the what is the connection there between that and your well, astronomy? The, well, the short answer is it was a job. Um, oh, after, okay. after, after I completed my master's degree, I decided that I wanted to reach out to the real world. I had just gotten married. I decided that I wanted to spend more time with my wife rather than with my PhD. So I mm -hmm. decided I made a deliberate decision not to do a PhD. So I took my master's degree in observational astronomy and started applying for jobs. And while I applied for a few astronomy positions, Without a PhD in astronomy, those positions are there, but they're few and far between. But being a master's student in astronomy basically means that you have a very high quality physics degree. You now I'm taking graduate level e &M, graduate level modern physics and so on and so forth. So my physics qualifications are pretty darn good. Well, there's a lot of jobs out there for physicists, both in the energy industry, oil and nuclear. And there was a position available at the Atomic Energy of Canada uh, looking after a nuclear reactor in Manitoba, a little place called Pinawa. It was a research reactor that was doing material testing and was utilizing organically cool, uh, organic coolant rather than water. And so this was an experimental reactor running from, oh, give or take a bit, uh, 1962, 1963. Sounded an interesting position. 
I applied. I went through the whole interview process. They like my credentials. Uh, I like them. So I worked for the Atomic Energy of Canada for three years. Wonderful opportunity, really a very differing aspect uh, of physics because it was very practically oriented, as you can well imagine. Uh, but it also blended a little bit of uh, teaching because I had to help train the uh, reactor operators who were monitoring this reactor on a day to day basis, had to create fuel loadings for the reactor so that it was balanced for all the various experiments. Really, really neat job. But I did get a little bored with looking down into the ground at this nuclear reactor rather than looking up at the stars. Despite the quality skies in Manitoba, you know, my professional day to day activity wasn't associated with astronomy. And after three years, I found that I was missing that connection. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I turned back into uh, astronomy as a full time profession. So where was your transition between Australia and Canada? Because like all this time you were in university and masters with Australia and now you're no, doing no, a no. nuclear job in, oh, you're not? Sorry, <laughs> okay, so let, let me give you my full history here. That's okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. So mm -hmm. I, did, I, did my un, I did my undergraduate degree at the Australian National University in Canberra. So that was from 74 to 78. So that was a Bachelor of Science with honors in experimental physics. So I was playing with beamline technology and was sort of slamming atoms into metals and looking at ablations. And that, that was my master's that my, what we call our honors thesis in Australia, which is very similar to a one year master's thesis up here. At the end of that, I applied to do uh, graduate studies, which in Australia would have been a PhD up here in North America. It was applying for a master's degree. And so I applied to a number of differing locations uh, to do an honors, to, uh, sorry, to do graduate studies. And uh, it worked out that the University of Victoria was the group that I latched onto for doing my master's degree in astronomy. So I was out at uh, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, the University of Victoria, which is still one of the very best astronomy groups anywhere in the country. It's a great place and a lovely place to, uh, to live as well. Uh, so I came up to Canada in September of 78. The plan was to do a two years master's degree. Problem was, and it wasn't a problem at all, but the issue was I met my wife to be. And uh, well, I haven't made it back to Australia permanently <laughs> ever since. <laughs> so I did my graduate studies here in Canada. And because I had married my wife here, uh, we decided that Canada was going to be our collective home. And so I'm now a dual citizen. And you know, that's why I got, picked up a job at the Atomic Energy Canada, because that was important. And then why I became an astronomer in this country. And what was your specialization for your graduate studies? I collected data with my supervisor from a satellite that is no longer operational, the International Ultraviolet Explorer satellite. It was launched in 78 and I had data from it six months later, I actually went to uh, uh, NASA in um, Washington, D.C., Greenbelt, Maryland, in particular, to actually observe on that satellite, which was a really neat experience. Uh, and so I was looking for... Uh, the signature of the element boron in stars. Boron is a light element that might have been produced in very small quantities uh, at the Big Bang. Hydrogen, helium, and a dash of lithium. But there's uh, theories out there that talk about beryllium and boron, the next lightest elements, being formed at really, really small levels. And we went looking for signs of boron in a variety of stars. And so I was doing spectroscopy in the ultraviolet uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum, looking for signs of the element boron, trying to put thresholds on how much boron was or what well how much more was present in these stars and, and how do you differentiate between boron that was that originated from the big bang and boron that's being created now uh, boron isn't created now that's the point oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so if you find it it's primordial <laughs> okay oh ah. so, so what well, what were your findings from that like did you find like a certain threshold for boron or did you did you find what you were looking for the threshold I guess the answer is we didn't find what we were looking uh, for because there was no significant quantity above threshold levels. I don't remember what the threshold level was that we determined, but basically we could not find evidence 
down to the level of resolution that the IUE satellite was delivering us, we could not find evidence of boron in these stars. So there was a threshold that we could put. Don't remember what that was now. That was like 40 years ago, guys. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's what we were looking for, signs of boron in these stars. And we were looking across a variety of differing uh, stars so that we could differentiate between you know the more long-lived stars versus you know the more recent uh, stellar populations couldn't find the stuff but it was nonetheless interesting to look at the spectrum because we found lots of other stuff in there which we uh, commented upon but boron itself no we were unsuccessful in finding any significant quantity in those stars yeah and let me know if this is just like a quick answer but what is it about boron that makes it a primordial element uh, basically because, well, yeah, the short answer is hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron are the simplest elements. And there's no naturally occurring process in stellar nucleosynthesis that generates those particular elements. Uh, well, le let me rephrase that. Hydrogen converts into helium, of course, but there is no stellar nucleosynthesis process that generates lithium, beryllium, or boron. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, process at the supernova end or the merger of neutron stars, black holes and so on, that generates light elements down there. So there's no known, unless something has popped up in the last 40 years, and I must admit I haven't been keeping tabs of it, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no known process that can generate lithium, beryllium or boron. So the only stuff, now we can create it in humanity, you know, it, it, we, we can create those elements, however, naturally occurring sources no oh so w when you deal with like your variable star research because i mean we haven't actually got into like the research that you conduct right now right like because you're a kind of variable star astronomer mm -hmm. does does i guess does any of this does any of this knowledge from like your graduate school like come into like play like ha have you ever have you ever done something in your graduate or undergrad which you use to this very day in your observational variable star research? One of the things that I did while I was doing my master's degree, studying spectra and looking for boron, uh, is that I was also working with one of uh, the other professors in the department, looking at eclipsing binary star systems. So they are not what we call intrinsically variable, they are extrinsic. That is to say, because of their uh, continuous eclipse processes, they are changing their overall light output. Um, so it's similar to intrinsic variable stars where they're sort of pulsating as a result of you know, nuclear uh, stellar processes. I, for th the uh, three summers that I was in Victoria, was a research assistant, and we looked at these binary star systems every clear night that was possible during the course of the year at the campus observatory. We also used the spectroscopic capability of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory to measure the radial velocity of some of these stars. Bottom line to it is I was knee deep in variable star research right from the get-go, even though my primary thesis was associated with spectroscopy and looking for boron, but sort of 50% of my time was spent <laughs> pretty close to 50%, analog looking at, collecting the data for the other types of variable stars, these uh, binary star systems, and analyzing that data. And in fact, I ended up with more papers out of that work than I did out of boron. Uh, that's just the way it worked out in this particular case. Uh, so variable stars became a part of my life as a master's student. The fact that I'm looking at uh, you know intrinsic variable stars, stars that are very similar to Cepheid variables, SX Phoenicia stars, that's just happening to be the, the 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 branch if you will that i ended up you know developing most at york i didn't come to york with the plan aha we're going to do essex phoenicia stars <laughs> yeah i came to york doing a variety of different things including just you know training undergraduates and graduate students on data collection processes but it worked out that essex phoenicia stars have got all the right attributes to observe on a university campus anywhere on the planet. And so we adopted that project and we continue to observe every clear night, looking at a subset of those stars to this day. Awesome, yeah. And I just remembered a question that I had when we are talking about neutron stars. And so apart from knowing that they exist, 
What do astronomers have to learn from observing these neutron stars? Well, neutron stars, as I said, are the end products of stellar evolution. And so it gives us a little more insight into, you know, the start to end process, the life cycle of a star. Neutron stars, of course, are also pulsars. If we have got the, the right orientation, those intense objects intense from a gravitational field perspective are also intense from a magnetic field perspective and they can with the right environment sweep a beam of radiation across the earth on a really really regular basis the crab nebula for example has got one of the brightest pulsars in the night sky and it's uh, sweeping across us you know 30 times a second so when we're seeing pulsars that gives us more insight into the magnetic field composition that is associated with those stars it talks to us about you know as i said the end state of a stellar evolutionary process so learning more about neutron stars and now of course with gravitational waves being detected neutron stars merging with white dwarfs neutron stars merging with black holes and so on, gives us another insight into these particular objects and what they can do with you know the, during the merger process so it you know, i think of the universe very much like a jigsaw puzzle you know if you've got a, a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle with every single piece face down every object in the universe every wavelength band in the electromagnetic spectrum represents a piece of the puzzle and so you turn over that piece of the puzzle hoping to gain insight into the picture as a whole the only problem is we don't know what the picture looks like like a regular jigsaw puzzle you've got a photograph there and you know what you're working towards in our case in astronomy and astrophysics all of the pieces are face down and we're not real sure what the final picture looks like we've got ideas but we're not certain and so neutron stars and their analysis just another piece of the bigger puzzle that talks to us about the operation of the universe and, and the bigger puzzle uh, might be infinite. <laughs> as well. Probably is. Yeah, a thousand pieces mightn't be a big enough puzzle. It might be 10,000 yeah. pieces. Hey, I think of it as job security. Okay. I mean, you know, <laughs> if, 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 talking if we, about like the, the infinite, the infinite puzzle, right? Like I was, I was just, I was just wondering and I was just like looking up these, you know, these questions, you know, before, before like we, we, we had this uh, conversation here and I was just, and, and a very common question was, and, and something that I was just, you know, just continuing to think about is, can we ever, ever estimate the true size of the universe? Because we are constricted by the observational universe, right? And we can mm -hmm. estimate it to a, to a very reasonable degree. Obviously, it's not exact because it keeps increasing, but we can, we can estimate it. But my question is, will we, do you think, we would ever be able to, like humanity as a civilization, would ever be able to estimate the true size of the universe? Or do you think it's just infinite? If, if we really do believe that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit, I think the answer has to be no. We'll never really know. You will be able to develop theories, uh, models that you can test experimentally and have confidence that the predictions of your model suggest that it is this big uh, but because you know we have been <laughs> we're existing 14 billion years ish since the beginning since the big bang uh, and because the expansion rate is occurring and because we're limited by as you say the horizon the speed of light we never really will know for certain the extent and that's putting aside the question of multiverses i mean yo are we the only universe that is out there uh the, perhaps the only way we will ever really know is if in fact an old theory which we don't believe is true anymore if we're eventually going to stop expanding and begin to contract back towards a big crunch if we're in an oscillating universe you know now fast forward here tens of billions of years guys because this is not going to happen anytime soon mm -hmm. but i guess technically we could if we are in a collapsing universe we could quote determine the extent of the universe if we're in this oscillating big crunch type scenario but that to the last i heard cosmologically speaking that is not believed to be the correct analysis the correct state of our universe we do think we're in a continually expanding universe and if that is really the case then 
you know, we will not necessarily know the true extent of our universe. Mm. And does that have any significance in terms of the mass density of our universe? If it just keeps on expanding eventually, like the... <laughs> Yeah. Well, back, well, back 20 years ago, we thought the, the critical density of the universe was really important to try and determine whether or not we were in a forever expanding or a just expanding or indeed, you know, the, the crunching type collapsing universe. The critical density of our universe was really, really important. Given the um, uh, findings associated with dark energy, and the repulsive force that is associated with dark energy, then the critical density of the universe, as I understand, and remember, I am not a cosmologist, okay, but as I understand it now, dark energy has overwhelmed the concept of the critical density. Uh, there is now simply not enough matter in our universe, even when we start factoring in dark matter, dark energy overwhelms that and continues to push outwards. Mm -hmm. So I don't think critical density, total mass of our universe is nearly as important as it once was, as I said, 20 or so years ago, when we weren't aware of dark energy. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. dark energy, because I'm actually not too sure about this either, but dark energy, does do, is that continuously created and is expanding the universe? Like how, how do we believe that the universe is expanding via dark energy? Do we believe that more and more dark energy is being created and therefore expanding the universe? Or like, what is the exact, or like, I guess we don't have an exact answer, but like, what is the <laughs> estimated answer that we have for why dark energy is expanding our universe? Okay, so I'm going to put the caveat here. You need to speak to one of my colleagues who deal with this okay. sort of stuff because this stuff yeah. keeps changing. When mm -hmm. I went to university, none of this stuff existed. So I've been <laughs> learning it like you on the fly. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, I but, understand. But, but, but dark energy is associated with the vacuum of space and it is an intrinsic quantity or an intrinsic quality associated with space itself. Unlike dark matter, which is getting diluted as the universe expands you know the quantity of dark matter we don't think is increasing and so as the universe gets larger and larger the density of dark matter is going down read that to mean that dark matter was much more important when the universe was younger and therefore smaller okay mm -hmm. and so we are no longer living in a dark matter dominated universe whereas in the past we were we are now living in a dark energy dominated universe about if if memory serves something like 67 percent of the matter energy balance mm -hmm. is associated with dark energy and that's what's propelling the expansion process whether or not dark energy is increasing because the universe is increasing in its size i believe that is true but i'm going to stop there because i'm going to have all of my my theoretical cosmology guys all over me going no 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 you don't know what you're talking and i don't really <laughs> <laughs> okay but the matter energy balance in our universe 67 percent is dark energy that now dominates the processes locally in and around galaxies and galaxy clusters, dark matter is far more important because you know the gravitational properties of dark matter. But when we're starting to talk about cosmological scales, dark energy is the dominant uh, characteristic, and that is pushing us outwards at an increasingly rapid rate. Hmm. I was I was reading somewhere that, uh, and and this is I think the the craziest thing that I have ever read, that dark matter. Now listen to this. Dark matter could be gravity from other higher dimensions. And I read okay. that. And I was just like, wait. <laughs> what? What do you think? What do you think about that? I... I, I don't think about it. Uh, that, that's the short <laughs> answer. I have trouble trying to con try to contemplate the multiverse. I mean, one of my colleagues uh, actually models differing universes that are sort of nominally spherical that bump into each other, so as to speak. And we try to search for observational evidence to support the conjecture of the multiverse. 
this oh. is stuff which is sort of you know way out of my comfort zone i mean you know as i said before you know i'm an observational astronomer i love stars you know i can touch stars so as to speak i can see stars i can model stars i i understand stars when we start talking about multiverses and perhaps you know multi-dimensional impacts on our universe no i stop and you know i, I read it um, but sometimes I'm not sure whether or not I'm reading science or science fiction because mm -hmm. I just don't really follow it. it. It really is an exciting area of modern astronomy, but it's not an area that I claim to have any level of expertise in. Mm -hmm. And so I can't really help myself but ask, if you were to speak to a person that believes that the Earth is flat, what would be <laughs> the first thing you would tell them? <laughs> Oh, that that that's such a loaded question because I would be standing there shaking my head at them, and of course that's not good. Good. I mean, you know, if somebody is genuine in their beliefs, you don't mock them, okay? But so right. you, you'd have to try and work your way through the evidence. You know, I, I would literally start with with the regular stuff about shadows being cast at the same time of day in differing parts of the planet, and the fact that. They are different lengths. How do you account for that if you're on a flat Earth? Uh, have you ever flown to Australia? Have you ever flown to Europe? Um, you know, do you think the the curvature that you can see out your window, the type of management, uh, the flight management that takes you from A to B, that depends upon flying along great circles? <laughs> uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Is all of that just nonsense? What about ships as they go over the horizon or come back over the horizon? What about the shadows on the moon being cast by the Earth? What happens to the International Space Station and the hundreds of people who have gone, the people who have gone to the moon? I would just try and quietly step through all of these fairly logical arguments and ask them, is there a worldwide conspiracy that is colluding together to make you believe that you know we're living on a round object when we're on a flat object i mean there are just so many lines of logical discussion that you would bring to bear on it but ultimately if they don't want to believe you they're not going to believe you but you don't mock them uh, you know i I'm, I'm just saying you know i shake my head because i find it hard to believe in this day and age with the evidence that the space age has given us, you know, let alone all the evidence prior to that, that people still are so adamant. It's a small fraction of people, but they are so adamant that, you know, we're wrong and that they are right. I, I mm -hmm. just have difficulty understanding that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were we were previously uh, uh, so recently, actually, we had an episode on the Math and Physics podcast where we were talking about this. And I think every single point you just brought up was was spoken by us. Like we hit every single point home, and obviously we have we had quite a few you know people comment that they still do believe that the Earth is flat. And I think to be honest, Parker and I handled that very well. Like we like every single person that commented on these episodes, like exactly as you said, we didn't mock them. We were just you know we were just going through facts and logic and reasons to why they could be potentially wrong. And obviously, as you said, if someone is just very, very determined, very adamant in their belief, sometimes, you know, some, first of all, don't mock them. Second of all, you might not even be able to change it because they just think their worldview is right. So that's obviously yep. like a special case. Yep. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking when we were talking about the multiverses, I was, I've always had this thought and I've, I've, I've never really thought about it because I guess we can never really know. But do you think it's, possible that the laws of physics are different in other universes like for example the speed of light is a little different maybe you know like the lorenz transformation is not one over but it's multiplied or something like that i'm yep, just yep. like yep is it is from it, what, from what I get, I, from what i have read and i've listened to uh, my colleagues give presentations in this regard it's a commonly held expectation Mm -hmm. that the laws will vary from one universe to another. Uh, you know, will they be you know, completely inverted? So gravity is not an attractive force, it's a repulsive force. I've never heard anybody sort of go to that extent. Wow. Wow. Uh, but <laughs> in differing universes, will the laws of physics change subtly? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that wow. seems to be a common hill bullet. But again, it's, it's theory. 
we've we've got no experimental mm -hmm. uh, evidence one way or the other. It is conjecture, and that that's one nice thing about theoretical physics, theoretical astrophysics. You can play with just about every possible parameter to see what types of uh, observational effects might be available to you. That is, in in a sense, the strength of theoretical astrophysics. The fact that you know you are able to diversify your processing play with your model uh, to, to sort of wild extents to see what trends might exist, to see what observational evidence you might be able to bring to bear to help you understand whether or not you're on the right track or not. Uh, it, sometimes I quip that, you know, given enough variables, you can make black, white and white, black. I mean, you know, it's it's it <laughs> seems to me that my theoretical colleagues can turn anything into anything. But it's also the greatest strength of that type of uh, reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to see an experiment that uh, shows evidence of a multiverse. And if I had to take a guess, it would be with wormholes. And, you know, we, we've never actually seen a wormhole if I'm, you know, if I, uh, you know, I can't, I can't remember ever seeing a, a, no, a publication we... about that. But, no um I'm thinking that if we do somehow find like definite conf confirmation of like the ability to fold space time and travel through, it, it would be like a, a revelation in the idea that we can travel through this other dimension, right? Mm -hmm. Between two, two points in space time. So you need to have a conversation with one of my colleagues up at York, uh, Saeed Rastegu. He gave a presentation just this past Wednesday in our uh, journal club talking about black holes, wormholes, the direction of time, uh, and all the sorts of stuff that I think you guys would just lap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after about half an hour, I was beginning to see, you know, zeros and ones in ways that I just don't want to talk about. <laughs> uh, but it was really a fascinating exp uh, expose. And it was all founded on, you know, relativistic theory, mm -hmm. talking very, very definitively about the relationships between black holes, white holes and wormholes. Mm -hmm. So pull him in, have, have a chat, have go for broke. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, a few, no, I think about 10 days before Stephen Hawking died, he released a paper, a research paper that was claimed or not claimed, but he basically, I guess that was the point of his research to wait. I'm, I'm just going to re, uh, read it out from here. It's final research paper suggests that our universe may be uh, sorry, su suggests that our universe may be one of many similar to our own. And this theory resolves around a cosmic paradox uh, that was made by Stephen Hawking. And I just thought that like, that's an interesting thing to talk about since we're talking about the potential for multiverses and the fact that Stephen Hawking himself, you know, had this idea. I think that's, I think that's oh, it, cool. It is an exciting area. That That yeah. is for sure. Um, you know, as we have gotten more data about the first moments of our universe, we, you know, when we look at maps, you know, of, of the cosmic background, micro, mi microwave background radiation and the very subtle variations in temperature that we're detecting and so on and so forth. That experimental data is fueling a lot of revelations, if you will, or a lot mm -hmm. of experimentation in the area of theoretical cosmology. And yeah, Steve Hawking, one of the most brilliant minds of all time. It's not a surprise that he was dabbling in that area mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, it, it is an area that uh, is not one of my comfort zones, but it is exciting for those graduate students who have got strong backgrounds in math as well as strong backgrounds in physics. There is no shortage of astrophysicists out there who are really dabbling in the multiverse. And mm -hmm. you know, I think over the next 10 or 20 years, we are going to see some really significant advances in this arena. And I hope that one of the things that we see coming out of their work are some real observational tests to help narrow down, to constrain the models. Because when all is said and done, that's what theory and observation are all about. 
we go out as observationalists to pick up the data to help constrain the theories. I mean, that, that's really what we're doing with the variable stars. You know, we're trying to constrain what's happening for the internal energy generation processes of these variable stars as they go through the instability gap on the hertzsprung russell diagram. It's constraining the theory. What you guys are talking about is constraining theories on the grander scale of them all, you know, the universe <laughs> or the universes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to have observational tests to help our theoretical colleagues constrain their models. Otherwise, the variables are just, you know, completely, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other. We need those observations to help them. And I think we're going to see that over the next 10 to 20 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I really do hope so. Mm -hmm. that would oh, be, you'll that you'll be a part of it. I mean, you yeah. know, you're 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 right on the the the, mm -hmm. the, the threshold of your careers. You know, you're mm -hmm. doing your bachelor's degrees at the moment. That leads you to graduate studies and postdocs. That's where the excitement really. I mean, you think you're spending hours on your studies at the moment. Wait till you become a postdoc, guys. <laughs> Forget about <laughs> sleep. <laughs> so as 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 we're talking about, you know, moving to the multiverse and like or like potential for multiverses before we really you know dive into that because that's a whole new regime i heard that you're teaching a course on life on mars so well, astrobiology yes yeah so would you <laughs> i don't know like obviously like don't give, give the, the, the full rundown that might take too long but i was just asking like maybe you would want to like discuss a few of the major points where you believe that we can sustain life on mars or do, would you think that 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 would well, like one day human civilization will be able to live on Mars without a, a, a constant rocket or like a constant journey from Earth, like without bringing resources from Earth, would a yeah, civilization yep. be able to exist on Mars? I believe the answer is yes, it will. Okay. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. I mm -hmm. suspect we are talking about self-sustaining uh, settlements on Mars within the 21st century. I, I do believe that. Uh, you know, it, it's a mix of both science and science fiction. I mean, we've obviously read lots of science fiction stories over the last century that have spoken about living on Mars. And let's face it, it's been in TV as well and, and the theatres. So putting aside the science fiction and just think about the science fact at the moment, Mars is an environment that has a lot of similarities to Earth. The soil's composition is very similar to ours. We are talking about significant quantities of ice on the planetary surface or just beneath the planetary surface. It's unclear whether or not there really is liquid aquifers under the surface. But regardless, there's a significant amount of ice that's on the surface. And so you, know, you put that in a pressurized environment, melt it, all of a sudden you've got water, you break water down, you've got oxygen to breathe, you've got hydrogen for fuel. You know, there is lots of of similarities of the Martian environment that with a little bit of engineering, we will be able to utilize and no different to surviving in Antarctica or some of the more extreme environments here on Earth. And it can be self-sustaining. It will require some support, obviously, from planet Earth initially. But once you get yourself up to a certain sustained level of enclosures, then you will be able to build your own crops and synthesize your own foods and so on and so forth. So I don't think we're that far away from doing that at the moment. The biggest hurdle, of course, is throwing enough material at that base settlement from Earth to get it to that self-sustaining level. And let's face it, our rocketry is pretty immature still. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I remember you, you – what was that um, – uh, program that you love, the Kerbal Space Program. Kerbal Space Program. Right, okay, a game. Okay, okay. I've never forgotten you in playing with that and so on and so on. You know, we're nowhere near as developed as that program would suggest from a rocketry mm -hmm. point of view. You know, we, we can only deliver a thousand, a few thousand kilograms of material to Mars every 26 months or thereabouts. So that's one of the biggest problems. But the answer to your question is, yeah, I think we can put a settlement there. We've got to be careful of the radiation environment. Absolutely. I'm not convinced that we are justified in terraforming Mars, but that's a conversation for later on. I think we can utilize the Martian environment with our own engineering and create self-sustaining settlements. And I don't think it's that far away, but I think we are talking decades. Whether or not life is on Mars, that's the big question, because if life has survived from the earliest days of Mars's environment, four billion years 
or so ago. That might be the biggest hurdle to overcome <clears throat> because, you know, Martian life may be very dangerous to human life unless you and I are really Martians. <laughs> the theory of panspermia suggests that meteorites from Mars, and we know there are about 70 or so on Earth at this point in time, at least, maybe they transported life from Mars to Earth back 4 billion years ago. Yeah. And if that's the case, you and I are basically descendants of Mars biology. Well, in that case, Martian life is not going to be terribly dangerous to human life because we're one in the same. Who knows? But it is a going theory for panspermia. But if life does exist on Mars, that is going to be a big question mark with respect to can we safely and successfully build a life on Mars? And if we are, can those folks ever return to Earth? So the question of the life on Mars has bigger implications than just, yes, we're not alone in the universe. It really does talk to the issue of whether or not we can safely colonize, settle Mars. Mm -hmm. And is there any consideration of floating cities on Venus, or is that just purely science fiction? To the best of my knowledge, that one's purely science fiction at this point in time. <laughs> I like those stories, but I've not yeah. heard anybody seriously talk about that, other than perhaps airborne um, laboratories, you know, floating a science mm -hmm. package in the uh, atmosphere of Venus <clears throat> to study the Venusian environment. Getting a spacecraft onto the surface of Venus is really, really hard. And once you get it there, we've not survived for more than five hours because of the pressure, temperature, and you know the acidic environment, the erosive environment of the of, of the surface. So maybe our next best analysis of Venus outside of radar from orbit will be to balloon float a science package in the atmosphere. But that's not what you were asking. You were asking about no. floating cities. <laughs> but the idea of floating science laboratories uh, to better understand the Venusian environment, that's a real science concept at this point in time. Awesome. Yeah, yeah so it's been a little bit over an hour now. And so I think we can wrap it up here. Mm -hmm. um, it's been awesome talking to you. Uh, the topics of conversation were absolutely fascinating. Well, I'm delighted to have been here and chatted with you guys. And uh, you know, good luck with your the rest of your ongoing podcast. This is a great service to students, high school and university, to expand their horizons and to you know just show the passion that physics and astronomy can generate. Because I think sometimes people don't think we're passionate, but <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely and so uh rehan any closing words um well i think the only thing i can say is thank you so much for coming on because this was truly uh truly quite quite interesting we've always wanted an uh, like an astronomer like or at least some kind of astronomy because we have the, the most um the most continued episodes on our podcast like the ones with the most parts like you have part one, part two, part three is the astronomy episodes. <laughs> and we were always like, you know, maybe we can one day get like an, an actual astronomer who, you know, <laughs> looks at the sky. And well, obviously, first person that came into my mind. And I think I think it was truly nice. So thank you for coming on today. It's truly an amazing talk that we had. Yeah. Well, as I say, my pleasure, guys. And good luck for the rest of this year for your studies as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. And so... If you are listening to this podcast right now on Spotify or on Apple or anywhere else, podcast and stay up to date episodes. Also, we are on YouTube posting this video version of the podcast. Um, other than that, our email is math.physics.podcast at gmail.com if you want to send us any comments or questions. Or you can find us on Instagram at math.physics.podcast. So this has been episode number 48 of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we will see you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>